Got her. That's her. That is her. Dude, dude, Mike, it's a humongous tiger. Oh my god, dude. Here we got her. Oh my gosh. We got her. Holy cow. The Gadorzy hog. Dude! Dude! Welcome to the Musky Therapy Podcast. Please follow me this way. The doctor is ready to see you now. All right, folks, welcome to another episode here on the Musky Therapy Podcast. I don't know about you, I love ice fishing, but I am definitely in need of a little bit of musky therapy. And today, I have one of the most spectacular musky fishing guests that you are ever going to hear on this podcast. Um, a man who has certainly garnered interest from people all over the country in Ontario and beyond. Um, one of the best guides in the business and uh, an incredible uh, videographer. So, uh, Doug Wagner, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> I appreciate the intro. That was, uh, that, I think you gave me more credit than I deserve. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 I think that you, uh, you, do, you do so much for the sport, man. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I appreciate your, your humble uh, kind of nature. But, yeah, Doug, you, you definitely are a name in the game. You've been a name for many, many years now. Um, actually, I mean, how many years have you been guiding now? I mean, it's been a while. I just finished my fifth season, and honestly, it, it just feels like last week that I started. Um, but when I – there's two ways to look at it. Like, it feels like I started last week, but then I start to look and look at, like, how much I've evolved as an angler um, from 28 from the spring of 2018 until today. And I didn't know a damn thing back then. Like, I, I knew nothing um, compared to what I know now. And it, it's been really cool to see – how I've grown as anglers, see all the things that I've learned, all the places that I've been able to go. Um, it's just crazy, but it, it does feel like yesterday that I just started, but time, time flies. It, it's been five years, which is actually a, a pretty decent chunk of time. It, it is. It, it, like you said, I totally agree with you. And, and more so than ever, I feel like as you and I age and you hear this from older folks that have been in the game for a while, it's like, it just, it, it keeps going faster and faster. So um, it is kind of scary. And it's like, I think, you and I will both agree that it does kind of fuel your next day or your next season because we've, you know, what's, what's that next step for us? What's that next bar? What's the next accomplishment? What do you want to do with this? And uh, it's, it's, it's a very exciting, you know, career to be involved in. So, so that's awesome, man. Uh, so Doug, just to kind of kick things off, man, uh, I know that everybody knows you. Um, like you said, you've, you've been, you've been uh, a bigger and bigger and bigger name in the musky industry, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, recent years. And um, you've been all over um, YouTube and, and you name it on, on different, uh, you know, shows across, you know, across the country. But for those of you that, that may be listening, folks that are new uh, to, to uh, you know, musky fishing in general, if you're new to musky therapy and you're just getting into the sport, uh, Doug, maybe just kind of introduce yourself to, to the folks, to the listeners um, maybe start with, you know, your guiding. Where do you guide? I mean, you're all over the place. I'm actually pretty curious myself to know what your schedule is. Um, and I know kind of like, you know, some basics where, you know, you start in, you know, at Green Bay. And then I know you spent some time in Minnesota and you're in Ontario at, at uh, you know, Cedar Island. So maybe just kind of walk us through like a typical season for you. What are you doing? And then maybe we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm 28 years old. I, I grew up in southern Wisconsin. Um, I was basically offered a full-time guiding position, um, in Green Bay when I was 22, um, and kind of jumped on that opportunity. And now my kind of season, um, guiding, I, I, I guide for a lot more than just muskies. I do smallmouth and walleye stuff is a huge part of my business. Um, but I start with walleye fishing on March 20th, every single year in Green Bay. Um, I do walleye stuff from March up till about the beginning of May. And then I do a handful of weeks of smallmouth stuff. And then once our northern musky opener, um, long long weekend in the end of May starts, then for me it's just muskies from there on out, um, just due to the client base that I have, and that's what people want to fish for. And it's all good by me because once musky season opens, I, I could care less about anything else that swims. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, I, I start my season in Green Bay for walleyes and smallmouth and muskies. Um, and then from there, the last couple of years, once COVID hit, um, I actually moved some of my stuff to Minnesota for uh, a couple time for a couple weeks and then after that i move up to the northwest angle lake of the woods in minnesota and then i guide up there basically the month of july um the whole month of july and then i come back to green bay in august and then guide there until the middle of october and then after that 
um, after October, I basically just kind of, I'm done guiding, I should say. Um, that's kind of my fun time, my fun fishing. I worked every single day from the middle of March um, until that middle of October. And then I kind of just take some me time. I go fish with my wife a bunch. I go fish with some friends, um, some buddies, and I go travel around any, all over in Canada, uh, Lake of the Woods and, Lax, and uh, not Lax, so, um, Eagle Lake, um, Pipestone, um, lakes like that, that I just, I love to fish and get away. And it's, that's just kind of my vacation is, is fishing. Um, I, it was just funny. A lot of people call me crazy for that, but I just, I love it so much. Um, but for me, it's just moving around and hopping around keeps me fresh. Uh, but that's kind of the look at, at my season. And then the off season, I'm generally sitting in front of my computer, editing YouTube videos from the entire season and all the, you know, filming and content that we created throughout the year. A uh, little bit of ice fishing. Um, lake trout fishing is super fun. I was actually lake trout fishing today. Uh, we just opened up here on January 1st. So I've been out here the first couple of days of the season and just got out, had a good day today. But and mainly my winners are just editing content, getting my boat ready for the next season, lining up customers and and doing all the, the not so much fun stuff on the, the back end of the fishing <laughs> business. Dude, that's and, and so just I mean, how many days on average? So I mean, I was just uh, doing some uh, back of the napkin math, as they say, not not too hard, but it sounds like you have about three months of off time. Where even though it, we, I guess I'd call it off time, you're still fishing, you're ice fishing, you're editing content, you're doing all the social media aspects of the of the business. Um, but really, you know, you're on the water. Um, you know let's say nine to 10 months a year or something like that. I mean, how many days do you spend on the water? Would you say on average? I mean, I don't, I, I honestly couldn't, I mean, what are, it'd be easy math, but not math isn't my strong suit, but basically every, <laughs> from March 20th, which is when I start, I generally get out for a couple of days before I start guiding um, just to get a feel for what's going on. As long as the river allows it, um, I get out for a couple of days there, but I don't, I don't take any day. I think this next year I'm taking, five days off to go hang out with my wife for her birthday. And then I'm taking four days off to go fish a muskie tournament with her on Lake of the woods. But other than those nine days, I work seven days a week. Um, I know last year when I started the season, I don't know how many days it was, but I had 249 guide trips booked um, for the season. Now, some of those are doubles. I do run a lot of doubles where you run. Oh, but see that right there answers the question. I mean, that's dude, that yeah, is yeah. a, that's a busy schedule, man. That's, that's, that's the only number I know. Um, and like I said, that, that is a lot of trips, and I, I do truly work seven days a week. And you have to, being a, basically a seasonal worker, um, it's kind of like you know the flip side of when I used to work construction, um, I would get my winters off, and you know I'd work all summer. And it's kind of the same thing, I guess, where you work all summer, and then the winters I'm not technically guiding, but it's a lot of my days still consist of you know preparing myself for the upcoming season and, and still working. It's just not time on the water or guiding customers. Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 uh, you know, folks listening, I, you know, you're probably like me and that, you know, and even if you're, you're a fellow guide, I mean, you know, I guide in, in the state of Wisconsin and, um, I might do a little videography work in, in, uh, Ontario, but that's it. So I'm, I'm very, um, I guess you could call me a little sedentary. So I'm, I'm very interested in a couple things. Uh, Doug, just based on you know the, the the size of your operation, because you're you're in multiple states and and, and uh, countries, so and I know your wife Jessie, she um, her family is it? Does she own like Cedar Island Lodge or is she? How does that operation work? And how do you how do you? I guess my 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 uh, tag along question is, where do you guide out of on Lake of the Woods, and how does that whole thing work when you take that month of July and you go up there? Yeah, so. Um... I guess to start off with the first question, my wife is, is my wife, Jesse Baker, um, is not only a hell of a fisherman. Um, well, I've seen that. <laughs> we, we've been married now for a couple of years, um, but her parents own a resort on Pipestone Lake, um, which is about an hour east of Lake of the Woods. Uh, it's a beautiful lake. Uh, that's where I was actually trout fishing today. Uh, it's got muskies, walleyes, smallmouth, lake trout, um, pike, all that kind of stuff. You're, you're normal northwestern Ontario um, stuff, but that lake is landlocked by Canada. So I can't guide there legally. Um, I have to guide in the United States. So when I go to Lake of the Woods, I stay in the Northwest angle. And when I stay in the Northwest angle, um, basically if you're familiar with that area, there's a little notch of Minnesota that shoots up into Lake of the Woods. There's a couple islands there that are U S soil. Um, and I get a work permit through Canada in order to do this, but basically I have to start and end my day 
in the United States. So I stay on Oak Island, which is a big one of the biggest islands right by the border. It's about a mile from the border. Um, I stay on Oak Island, and then every day I'm allowed to legally, with my work permit, take my customers and cross the border by boat, um, fish in Canada for the day, and then at the end of the day I just have to return back to U.S. soil. So I have to start and end my day in Minnesota, um, and then it, that does allow me to then you know, guide and, you know, run my business in Canada for fishing for the day. And then like I say, at the end of the day, we have to come back to, um, Oak Island or mainland Minnesota land or, you know, the United States basically. Dude, that sounds incredible, man. Wow. Uh, and then, you know, of course, and I'm just curious to know, and we don't have to spend too much time on this because we got a lot of really amazing stuff to talk about tonight. But why did you, cause you know, I, I follow your stuff as well. I mean, I'm a YouTube junkie. I mean, I, produce my own show obviously but i watch everybody else's and um why why the shift to minnesota was that just i know you said during covid you kind of uh, you know took a i don't know i'm sure you you fished there uh, plenty in the past why um take the guiding operation to minnesota for a certain period of of this season sure so i used to fish before i was guide um i was a weekend warrior like a lot of people um i spent time in minnesota fishing um specifically lake vermilion was always kind of my go-to i would drive up there on a friday after work fish you know saturday half day sunday and then drive all the way home and it was crazy to drive eight hours to fish for a day and a half but um i would do that a lot and i just i fell in love with the open water the open water bite which is something that's getting a lot more popular but i first started uh, fishing lake vermilion when the open water bite was start was getting popular starting to get out in 2015 and did that for three years until i started guiding when and you know then when i first started guiding i didn't have the time or the money or the customers that wanted to go anywhere else i was working for underneath someone in green bay um where i had to do a lot of bass trips and you know walleye trips and other stuff like that just to pay the bills and make the money still come in um so i couldn't really go to minnesota and you know make it it wasn't worth my time or i couldn't make any money doing it so when COVID hit um i was actually my business was getting a lot more established i had a little bit more free time and then all my customers that i had lined up to go fish on lake of the woods um which i've been doing since my first year guiding all those customers we couldn't get into canada obviously oh okay so this this makes sense i see the wheels are turning in my head okay i just got stuck and i was like well our fishing in green bay um when our fish leave the rivers after like our first 10 to 14 days of the season, they push out of the rivers and then they just, they go out into the bay and it's, it's a lot bigger than any lake. I think a lot of people have ever fished and there's a lot of water out there and your odds of just coming across to fish out there on open water is very, very slim. So I would take, I took my operation, I moved it to Minnesota. I had a really good network of customers and people that believed in me and took a chance on me and followed me to Minnesota after I would not even been there um, in two or three years um, I called up some buddies of mine that I, you know, some really good friends of mine that lived in Minnesota. I found a couch to crash on at my buddy Jace's house, and he kind of gave me some insight on what was going around on his local lakes. And I just took the, you know, the knowledge and the information that actually Jason and I had, had learned on Vermilion fishing open water, and then moved that to Minnesota muskies. Um, and it's a super fun bite, and I absolutely love it. I think it's so cool when your boat can be over 60, 80, 90, 120 feet of water, and you're casting for muskies out in the middle of the basin, and you hook into these you know, big leech lake strain muskies. I just think it's so cool, and it's so fun, and it's such a change of pace for me, um, which I need, because if, if I had to fish Green Bay every single day for 20 years, I would lose my mind, and I would hate my job at the end of it. But <laughs> And keeping fresh and, and doing these other things really helps me stay fresh. Um, it, it helps me, you know, learn about other fisheries and how other fish act. And it, it just makes me a lot better angler when I do travel around to these different locations. And it worked out really well. We had a great season over there. And then once the fish actually moved out of the open water and then those fish start to move into structure, we had a really good bite there as well. I know we had a 55 incher that we caught in Minnesota that year of covid um, that was on structure up in a weed bed right at dark. We caught that fish. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was, it was cool and interesting. And, and Minnesota, I now, even at the borders open, it's still something that I love to do. And the Canadian opener is so far back. Um, it's the third week in June. So there's a little bit of a window there where green Bay is kind of done after the first 10 or 14 days. And then there's about a two week window where the Minnesota fishing is good. Um, before I can go to Lake of the Woods, you know, and obviously target muskies once their season opens. So that little window of time 
it gives me a break. Um, it's a change of pace. My customers enjoy it. I got a handful of guys that just love to come up there and do that stuff with me. And that just, it keeps Dude, me fresh. That's Doug. That's awesome, man. And, and I, and I enjoy, I'm sure everybody's enjoying listening to this. You're, it's, it's just very interesting to me to, to listen to how you've got this whole thing structured. And I'm sure, you know, a year from now when we talk again, it's like, you'll have a whole, there'll be a different, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, way in which you're going about it, but but it's really interesting to hear how things have kind of evolved and what you're doing. And um, just to kind of move into the next big thing, I mean, obviously you've, you've talked about this at length now, you know, you, you do, a, you know, your primary, um, you know, job is, is guiding, but you really have like this, this, this secondary layer that's obviously very important to what you and Jesse do, and that's videography, which interestingly for folks listening, and Doug, tell me if I'm wrong, I think, honestly, you and I kind of initially met because you did... Yeah a little bit of a videography for the fishing with Joe Booker television show way back in the day. Um, and then obviously here we are now and you've got, um, you know, your videography side of things is a, um, a big chunk of what you do. Yeah, no, it, it is funny because you and me did meet through Joe. Um, and honestly, I can say Joe changed my life and I think you would, you would be able to say the same and Joe changed my Absolutely. life. Absolutely. And, that took a chance on me and really gave me an opportunity to even get into the fishing industry, which is such a hard thing to get into, to start off to. And you honestly need to know somebody, um, to do it just on your own is incredibly hard. And I've had so many people that have helped me get me to where I am today. Um, people that I would never be able to do it without. Joe is one of them. Luke Ronestrand is another one. Jeff Wallace is another one. Like I could go on and on and on and name all these people that, I owe the world to that without them, I wouldn't be in the position I am today. But Joe was a huge part and really the first person who took a chance on me, took us, you know, gave me a shot. And it, he started actually, you know, my love for video or really wanting to capture, you know, my content on video. And from there, I filmed a lot of my own stuff. Um, the funny thing was, and this was a, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made, is I think um, I started the first time I ever filmed for Joe was 2013. He had a cameraman who was set in a tree stand, Brock, who I'm, I'm sure you remember. Oh was yeah, set in a tree the stand. pulverizer. And, and he fell out of a he fell out of a tree setting a stand and broke his leg. And it came down to Joe called me um, and said, "Hey man, my camera guy literally just fell out of a tree. He broke his leg. We're supposed to go on the shoot to Lake of the Woods next week. I don't have a cameraman. Are you available?" And at this point, I had just started. I just got out of, out of high school the year before, and I just started like a, a real job. Um, I worked construct, construction back in the day. I, had, I just started working for this really awesome union company out of Milwaukee. We did sewer and water work, um, but I'd been there for I think uh, three weeks or four weeks, and now I have to go ask my boss for ten days off to go to Canada in the middle of summer, which in construction is a huge no no. Um, <laughs> But I was lucky enough, my dad My dad uh, had worked for this company before and basically helped his company get off the ground when they started. And the owner had a little bit of a soft spot for me, and he actually let me go on that trip. And me and Joe and Rich Belanger went to Lake of the Woods, and I Joe, I ran up to Joe's. We went out on a little smallmouth lake. He went out, we caught like, he, went, he caught like three bass. He showed me how to run all the cameras. And he's like, okay, you're good. We're going to leave in the morning and go <laughs> television show that has been you know fishing with joe booker is one of the, the longest running publications of, of tv um of fishing that was ever created um and literally i got like a two maybe a three hour rundown on how to run all these cameras and equipment he's like okay you're good we're gonna go in the morning and it was just crazy to me um but he had the system and you know this too like his system was so dialed and oh yeah it was yeah a push button and you just needed someone there to hold the camera it wasn't it wasn't that hard. Um, and that it, really and to chew you out if you don't do something right every once in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I broke a piece on a camera. I forget what I did that week. I broke something, but, no, of course, Joe had a backup or a spare one. Um, and then Rich, and I, I will still blame Rich for this to this day. We get to a spot, and you you know the spot, the elbow. We get we pull oh, up yeah. the elbow. And and Joe goes up front, puts the troll motor in. Rich and I are in the back of the boat. And Rich just jumps up, grabs his rod, and flings one out there. I don't have anything set up yet. I just grabbed the camera. I'm putting it on the main arm. And Rich is coming in on this cast. And it takes a little bit of time. I'd say you have 60 to 90 seconds of setup time, right, from when you get to the spot to when your camera's actually rolling and filming. Oh, yeah. Camera's up. (laughs) 
fish didn't give me the time to do this, and this fish comes in and eats them both side, and I don't even, I'm not even recording yet. Oh, and my gosh. I, I hit record after he's had this thing hooked for like three seconds, and we Joe gets in the net, and he thought everything was just all fine and dandy. And finally, when we get to like a, a break point, when after this fish is unhooked and they're getting ready to kind of give their spiel, I'm like, hey, Joe, um, I didn't, wasn't, I wasn't recording when Rich hooked the fish. And I got a, I got a look. Which is, <laughs> uh, and it was, I, I still blame Rich for that to this day. And I, I love Rich to death. He's, well, he's such an awesome guy. Oh, yeah. Was yeah. Funny. Um, and it worked out good. We, we had a great ship. Those guys crushed them. And that was honestly one of the coolest things I think in my fishing career that I got to witness was just, I didn't get to go to Canada that year because of this trip. Um, I actually canceled my own personal musky trip I had planned for the following week. I was supposed to go to Lake of the Woods with a friend of mine. I actually ended up canceling that to go and, you know, step in for Joe and do this for him. Um, but honestly, I learned so much more by just sitting in the back of the boat and just keeping my mouth shut and just watching. I learned so much um, in that week, way more than I ever would have learned if I would have went up there and fished on my own for a week. It was just so cool to watch him fish, and I know I'm, I know you've learned a ton from Joe as well. Dude, uh, you're not kidding, man. To be able to it watch, was just so cool to watch. Yeah, and just in all those teaching moments, and I, you know, I, we're only really giving Joe a little crap for chewing us out every once in a while, but you you you, you gain so much insight into how to create a TV show, and then you know now here you are here both of us are we've both got these youtube channels and you know how did you i mean i guess that's my, you know, my next question doug is uh how did you kind of get into the youtube business now i mean you, you did a little film work for joe for a year or two and now you, you're guiding or i mean how did you how did you get into the youtube business and uh so we i uploaded my first video on november 11th of 2016 um it was a video from lake vermilion we did some fall fishing uh, my friend jace i mentioned before and then mason gerlock um, was actually along on the trip and the three of us went up, I filmed this video and I, it's funny because I said earlier, I'd, I'd filmed for years before that, but my biggest mistake I think in life is I always just filmed the stuff, but I always kept it to myself. I never put it anywhere. Um, I think I had three or four years of footage and filming of musky content that I just had on a hard drive that I kept for myself that I didn't put on YouTube or put on any social media platform. And wow. if I would had an extra three or four year head start on when YouTube really started to kick off, who knows where my channel would be at today? Um, maybe I wouldn't have to be a guide. Maybe I could just Dude, be a Dude, I, I feel the same way sometimes too. Yeah, but but it is what it is, you know. <laughs> it, it is what it is. And honestly, it, it started in 2016. Um, and then in, it, it really helped my guiding business a lot. Um, in 2018, once I started, 2017, we filmed um, a series called A Week on the Woods, which I think a lot of people in the musky world have watched. I know a lot of people <laughs> that have watched it over and over and over. Oh, yeah. But well, the one thing that comes to comes to uh, you know to mind with that is that I think it was probably on that first season, and that was with your buddy Forrest, right? Yep. yep. And and that was – you you had the – I don't know if it was – there were, I think it was the one. It was like the most – I think your, your video is still out there. It's like called the most incredible topwater strike of all time, right? When it's like yeah. – it, it was it was awesome. So yeah, that was pretty incredible series. It, and it, I mean, I might be a little biased, but I do think that is the most amazing topwater musky strike that's ever been captured on film. It's nuts. Yeah, I had nothing to do with it. I Ryan filmed it and Forrest caught the fish. I was just there to watch, and it was what Ryan did in that moment, and all the adjustments he made, and the dedication he had to follow in that topwater every single cast, every time Forrest would throw that lure. Um, we, it took us days and days and hours and hours and hours to get that shot, but we got it, and it is absolutely incredible. Um, but yes, that whole Week on the Woods series thing was something that really kicked off my guiding business once I started. Uh, we did that in 2017 before I was guiding, and then 2018 when I started guiding, we did do that series again with me, Forrest, and Ryan, um, and it just it worked out great. But then from there, YouTube is just an avenue. It's a social media platform, just like Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any of that stuff. It's just a way. For, it was a way for me to promote my business. Um, it's a free adver It's it's free. Nobody, you know, ever, anybody can put anything out there. There's advertisements all over Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and everything else now um, because it's free and it's a great way to market yourself and your brand and your business. And I I really use that. 
and put out a ton of content and YouTube really helped grow my business. Uh, my guiding business is really what YouTube was for. I, I never made a lot of money on YouTube. I still haven't made nearly um, the amount of money back on YouTube and time that I put into it, but it did help me in, in other ways for sure. Dude, I, I couldn't agree more with you, man. Same, same on my side. Um, and, and it is fun to create the content and it's obviously, um, it's such a challenge on so many levels. You know, I, I talk with so many people and they, uh, and I know you'll agree with me on this 110%, but it's like you're, you're dealing with, um, you know, outside of dealing with actual, uh, you know, guests or, or clients and, you know, but you're dealing with a live, you know, an animal and it's very hard to predict as, as hard as you and I try to, you're still dealing with, um, you know, something that is very challenging to understand. I mean, that's what drives us and to kind of have your whole, you know, uh, program hinging on, you know, your interaction with, uh, you know, a very challenging to understand animal. It, it makes the whole thing even that much more exciting, oh, I guess, in a weird way. Filming is, is so hard to do it right and to be able to capture the content in it. There is such a rush out of, not only catching the fish, but also knowing that you captured it all Um, because it it takes so much work and energy to keep all the cameras running and make sure they're positioned right and keep your lenses clean and all the work that goes into filming. And then when it all comes together, it's, it's like catching two, two, two muskies at once. Dude, Um, you couldn't have said that better. Yes. It's such such a rush. Um, And it's a challenge. And there's a lot of fish that I don't always fish and film. Um, when I'm guiding, I, I, I film sometimes, but most of the time I'm not, I'm not filming while I'm guiding, but there's so many instances I've had where it's like, Oh, what I would, what I would do to have that on foot on film. Um, but anyways, you, you, you can't, as it, it would drive me nuts to have to, you know, man all my cameras on every single guide trip and all year long. And it, it is so much work. And I don't think a lot of people understand unless, unless you have, um, done it yourself, how much work it is and how much of a pain it is because no. <laughs> whenever yeah. you want to be making a cast is when something always goes wrong. A battery dies, uh, a, an SD card is full or it just, that storm's coming and it just starts to sprinkle. And it's like, I can leave oh, my little dude, bit filming in the water. filming in the rain. And, and it's dude, it's, and it's easy with the cameras that I'm assuming you and I are using probably very similar things, but when you know, talk about, you know, back filming with Joe's old stuff. Oh my gosh. When it, when it rained and you're, and you're using those big, you know, older cameras, I mean, that was like, it was brutal. And it, it still is tough even with our, our current technology that's, you know, water resistant, waterproof to a certain extent, you know, but it's still, you're still dealing with batteries and wires and, you know, and, and then that's even one side of it. But like you said, you know, you've got screens and you've got, you got wind and you got, I mean, there's so many parts of it. It's, it's, but yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so Doug, um, actually before I, before I ask you, so, so one of our big questions coming up one, and I don't want to go too long on this. Sorry to, sorry to keep this cap, but a buddy of mine asked, and I'm like, you know what? That's a good question for Doug as we're kind of, uh, diving into the YouTube, uh, conversation here. Um, and I know you've been asked this question before, but another one of your videos, and this is an old one, uh, you released a video years ago and I believe you said, now this could have changed now, um, is it is 2023. It's kind of weird. Uh, but you said that you, you had a follow in the figure eight from, uh, at least at that point, whenever this was the biggest muskie you'd ever seen in your life. Mm-hmm. How big was that fish? Mm, put it this way. So I, at this point, this was 2018 when it happened. Um, at this point I had one fifty five incher under my belt. I caught the year before, um, and I was fishing with one of my mentors and idols, Luke Ronestrand, was in the boat. He was in the back of the boat. And then Kurt Hansen, who's now the owner of Thorn Brothers, was in the boat uh, next to me. Um, I'll put it this way. Luke Ronestrand has caught more 55 inches than just about, I think, anyone besides one person in the world. And when that fish came in and went around and around, and there's some things I would love to go back in, in that moment. But anyways. Well, dude, that fish was happen. moving, too, man. That was not, I mean. No, yeah. yeah. You could. There's a lot of different arguments you could make if I did things right or wrong. I would love to go back and have a second chance at it. Who wouldn't? Um, but anyways, when the when the fish swam off and we all kind of looked at each other, and I looked at the guys, it's like, oh, like that was a like a really fat 54, 54 and a half inch. Hey, and uh, Luke and Kurt just kind of looked at each other, and Luke goes, "Well, we caught a fifty five inch last week, and that one wasn't any smaller." <laughs> That's literally his quote. Um, wow. And to hear that coming from a guy, like I say, who has 
I think I think he's at like forty one or forty two fish over fifty five inches in his boat. Um, good judge. To, uh, hear that coming from him, like that he's about as good of a judge as you could ask for. Um, but yeah, that was that was pretty remarkable to to hear him say that. So I don't know how big it was, mid fifties. Um, I'm not going to go out and throw the sixty inch number out there, but it was a mid fifty inch fish. Um, just incredible, incredible animal. Incredible Dude, that's animal. awesome, man. All right, all right, folks. Here is. Um, here's one of the, what I'm really excited to ask Doug about here. And Doug, you and I have both, we've been in the YouTube game for a while and I saw something, um, come through, uh, you know, come through the pipeline on Facebook, social media. I think I saw it on Instagram and it was this new program that you're running with your, your YouTube channel. I'm super excited to kind of hear, um, what's happening, kind of take us there, take the audience there, um. So what's it called and what's going on? Is it Next Generation Muskies? It's more of a um, a member, you know, exclusive members only uh, kind of platform, right? I mean, what's kind of bring us bring us up to speed on what you're doing now with your channel? Sure, um, and this is yeah, I think this will answer hopefully a lot of questions because I got a lot of questions and concerns and feedback about this. But in October, we launched um, a new kind of avenue or new part to my YouTube channel and it's uh, YouTube memberships. It's a program that YouTube offers and basically it's a place where content creators such as you and I can put content and then we can set a certain price on it that in order for people to watch it, they have to pay a certain fee per month to watch this content. Um, And basically I get to set, you know, the price that I wanted to charge for it and then people can sign up for it and it's exclusive content and the only people that can watch it are the people that pay for the content. Um, that being said, it's it's forced me, I think, to make a lot higher end quali- uh, quality content. It's forced me to, I want to go a lot more in depth with a lot of my videos and honestly, it's just a way for me to justify how much time and energy I put into YouTube um, to get something back out of it where I think... Um, my guiding business now is at the point where I, I don't really have any room for any new clientele or new customers. Um, but the YouTube was something that I put so much time and energy and seven years of time into and 236 videos we have on that, on my platform, um, where I couldn't just let that kind of run stale, um, and dry out because as far as an advertiser for my guide business, I don't really, I don't need that anymore. It's not, that's not doing anything for me. Um, but I still wanted to create the content and help other anglers catch fish. It just has to, for me, um, it's hard to justify skipping out on a day of guiding to go out and create this content for kickback on YouTube. But when I put it on a general YouTube or a public page, um, just making ads, AdSense revenue off of that, which is how people on YouTube make money is basically when people watch the videos and there's ads before them and sometimes in the middle and at the end, that's how YouTube and content creators on YouTube make money. Um, and it's hilarious because I went back and ran through all the numbers and the analytics and I've put out since 2016, I've put out 168 musky videos on my channel. And I'm able to look back on YouTube and I can see exactly to the penny how much money I've made on every single video that I've posted. And the other night I was up till four in the morning running all these numbers and added up all of the money I've ever made. And out of 168 videos and seven years of time, I've made like $9,100 and some change off of YouTube. Yeah, and, uh, and, and most folks don't know, Doug, too. It's interesting. No, um, they don't. Well, not only that, but, but they don't understand like how this whole, you know, the monetization thing works is we as content creators only make 45% of every dollar that we, you know, every dollar that's generated through advertising, we we get less than half of it. Um, So there isn't a lot of money. I mean, and again, you know, we're, we're in kind of a niche marketplace. Um, You know, again, I mean, you've done a, you know, an absolutely phenomenal job. You've got a ton of subscribers, but still then, I mean, the, the amount in mass you have to achieve um, in viewership and in advertising advertisements that are even clicked or whatnot. I mean, you, you, to make a living doing solely that um, is, is kind of incredible. And people do it, but you know, we're it's it's on a little bit different um, spectrum than than we're in at least right now. At least right now, but yeah. Because, like you say, we're in such a niche market, and musky fishing is so small. Um, I'm lucky. Like I, 
there, I, I would say I have a friend of mine who owns a very large tackle company and has a, I would say, a very good idea of how many musky anglers are actually we actually have in the world. Um, and his estimate is we have somewhere between forty and forty five thousand active musky anglers. These are people that keep up on their equipment, maybe buy a couple new baits every year. They maybe upgrade a rod every couple of years or a reel. People that are just you know putting money into the whole entire um, industry as a whole and. I think I've, I've worked very hard on my channel to, I have basically, as far as a mainly musky based channel, we have the second largest channel on YouTube with a little over 19,000 subscribers and you can't make a living off of 19,000 subscribers. Um, it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely impossible, um, to make a living off of YouTube AdSense revenue. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, well then you, you I answered mean, my question in, in a big way. One of my, one of my questions I've written down is what, what led to this decision to kind of go to this, you know, uh, you know, plat this new, um, you know, membership uh, based system, which totally makes sense to me, Doug. Honestly, it makes a ton of sense. And, and I think, uh, you know, it, like you said, when you're, when you're, you know, not doing a day of guiding and you're, and you're losing out on that money, but you want to create this great content and people want the content, people want to learn, you know, it, it makes, it makes sense. Yep. No, and it, it's, it just, it takes time to create it. And I could go out and I can go fishing and be totally happy with, you know, going out fishing with no cameras. I do it all the time um, and just go out, have fun and enjoy fishing. It's not about it's not about me having to put it on a camera or me showing off to the world. I do plenty of fishing without cameras, you know, recording or filming. But there's a lot of people out there that want to learn um, more about muskies because it, they're such an interesting fish. And there's there's so little knowledge and information out there about them and it, it really always made me feel good um in all the public videos that i've posted where people said hey man i i really i watched this video i got this little tip from it and i caught this fish doing it or hey i watch all your videos and i learned all this stuff and i had my best season of musky fishing ever and it just helped me feel like i somehow helped those anglers you know be successful and that was such a good feeling to me um and i absolutely loved it and i and i still do it's just a matter of it comes down to what is your time worth everybody's time is worth something um, and it, it comes down to the point where I can't afford to put all this time and effort into YouTube anymore. If I'm, you know, I know I'm not going to make it big on YouTube and ever make, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or forty thousand, twenty thousand dollars ever on YouTube in a single year. Um, and the amount of time and effort I put into it is just insane. I, I ran the numbers. My average income per video is $34 per video which is just absurd for the amount of time that you put into well, filming. Well, yeah, thing. I mean, we're talking, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, get, you know, there's fuel for the truck and the boat, and then you've got, you know, a 14-hour day in the water, and then you've got, you know, minimally, you know, let's call it three hours to four hours of editing for that video. So you put all that in, and you make 34 bucks on it on average. So, okay, so so Doug, can I ask you a couple, let's let's dive in a little bit more on in, in next generation, next gen muskies on, on the Doug sure. Wagner channel here. So so how does this how does this thing work? If 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 folks, if you're listening here and you want to know more about this, so Doug, how does it work as far as I you know, from what I, I did a little research before we talked, it seems like signing up for this is pretty basic, but you know, it, it's pretty easy to do. But what's the monthly cost? You know, and then and then I want to know two things here, some piggybacking questions. What's different about this? So what do what do I get like as an exclusive member? What's kind of cool about these new videos? I know you talked a little bit about okay, these are going to be higher quality videos. What does that mean? What's different to me as a consumer? Um, and then the other thing, if I can kind of put all this in, and I, I saw there was a thing about like members only live chats. So like what's what's kind of going on? If I'm if I'm looking to get in the game here, like what what what's happening? So the 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 fee that I decided on for, for my channel was $7 and 99 cents per month is what the fee is in order to watch our exclusive content that comes to my goal is to keep it under hundred bucks. So that comes to like $96 and 88 cents per year for this exclusive content. Now in the past I've put out as much content as I could, but during all my guiding season and everything else, um, generally I put out between 25 and 30 videos per year and I basically edit all my stuff in the winter and then slowly let out one video per week throughout the season. And eventually I'd get to a point where I just ran out of content, um, in the 52 weeks of the year, but I didn't have any time to, you know, after getting done guiding for 16 hours a day, I didn't have time to go home and edit a video for five hours to upload 
to the people for the channel. But with our new members um, channel, we I made a promise to everybody that we're going to upload one video every single week all year long. So a minimum of 52 videos per year. And the goal, honestly, is 60. Um, 60 is kind of the number I'd, I'd really like to hit. 52 um, is going to be a cakewalk um honestly or we're gonna make that happen I, I promise that to my people we will make that happen at this point we're 12 weeks in and we've already uploaded 18 videos there so we're already a wow. little bit ahead of the number which is awesome um but even the the content itself um it's it's more in depth um i've done i did some stuff the other day where i had a video where we had um a lot of wind noise and it was super cold and it was really hard to just film things in the boat it was our high temperature was 16 degrees we were trolling we had all this wind and all this stuff that was just you know fighting us as far as a filming aspect but we caught four fish that day we had a great day and i i did something i'd never done prior and i brought it everybody back and then i went kind of through a whiteboard discussion of how to go about these things and draw up exactly how i was doing almost like a film study um, and draw it up so that people could see, you know, I draw out the structure and the brake lines and how the boat was positioned and which way the wind was blowing and how I had my rod set up. It was just a much more in-depth, detailed video as to, you know, what we were doing, what was going through my mind and what I thought made us successful. And there was a lot of things that I actually learned watching the video um, and then seeing the footage and then actually being able to go back and say, okay, look at this right here. When you see me turn the boat right here, I didn't know it at the time, but this actually caused the bait to speed up a little bit and then we get the strike. So it's really cool um, just looking back at it as well and seeing what all happened where maybe I was focused on my electronics or my GPS and where the boat was positioning that I didn't exactly know what made that fish bite. But once I look back, I kind of talked everybody through it. We did like somewhat of a film study on it um, to show people what really happened. And another cool, really cool thing that we do, um, I do a lot, I've done a lot of these in the past, but um, I call them tackle tips or it's small tackle adjustments. Maybe it's how to, you know, rig lures so that they get a higher hooking percentage or which leaders I like to use with, with which lures or which rods. There's so many small tackle things. Um, that make a huge difference in fishing as far as your presentation. Um, and a lot of those tackle tips, I think uh, I'm trying to do about 50-50 as far as fishing content and then off-the-water tackle stuff or boat rigging, electronic stuff, um, that stuff as well. And I also brought in a lot of my friends and people that are also guides in the industry that I think are really talented and really have a really good grasp of what's going on in their specific fishery. And I hired those guys then to shoot content for me or film content for me on specific topics that I feel like they know extremely well. There, there Maybe it's a certain kind of lure. Maybe it's a certain time of year. Maybe it's sucker fishing or trolling or different applications for muskies. Um, and paying those guys to create the content and then taking that and putting that on our membership because I don't know everything about muskies. You don't know everything about muskies. Nobody knows everything. And I think people should hear a lot of different you know, views or opinions um, about different subjects because maybe what I do doesn't always work for everybody. And maybe what you know, someone else that I bring in, maybe what they do would help someone else on our membership platform. So it's not so much um, about myself. I wanted to make it more about the community of people that we brought in or the members that sign up for this. I wanted to really, you know, make it worth their time. And it's honestly, like I said, pushed me to create better content. And when I say better videos, I'm not maybe talking about such a production side of things, but more of an educational side of things. That's really what I want to get, get from this. I want to teach people how to catch more muskies. I don't want to make more fancy videos or have fancy or editing that doesn't catch muskies. I want to teach people how to catch more muskies and what to do with that as far as, like, say, presentations and all these small things that, that I do and that I have thousands of hours of experience on the water to back up all my views and opinions on it. And I think it's just going to be a really cool place for anglers to come to and learn something. I think anybody who would sign up for a membership would learn something. Um, maybe you're not going to learn something in every single video or maybe the things in the video wouldn't apply to you in every single scenario. But for the price of less than a Big Mac per month, you're going to get something out of it that's going to help you be more successful in the water. And Dude, I think there's a lot of it's hard to it's it's hard to argue with that. And I I can tell how passionate you are. I mean, I'm I'm excited. I mean, this sounds this sounds incredible. And I love you know. There's it 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 brought up God. I must have I've learned this in high schools in some goofy English class. But uh, there's an old quote um, that it was stand on the shoulders of giants. And I love that you know you're talking about bringing you know, other experts in along with yourself to kind of really educate people. It's not just your opinion on something. You've got all sorts of other pros um, kind of trying to understand this fish that, you know, it's still amazing, you know, 
how many, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe centuries people have been fishing for muskies and we still, we still have so much to learn. So that, that's, dude, Doug, that's really, that's really, really cool, man. Um, and then, you know, last thing on, you know, on the next gen muskies, what's, what's with the live chats kind of, how do you, how do you work that in? Yeah. So I guess I got a little carried away there. Um, no, dude, I, I'm loving it, man. We got, we have, there's no time limit on muskie therapy. This is therapy. So, uh, no. So the live chats was just something else. I, I like doing live chats. Um, in the past I'd done a couple on my channel, but it was cool to just jump on and maybe show people. Like I know I did one back in the day when I, I got a bunch of baits at one of the muskie shows and I just went through like, you know, which baits I had bought and selected for, you know, why, and why, what I thought was unique or cool about them. But it's just a cool way to interact with, you know, at the time my subscribers and now going forward with our members um, and just answer questions that they might have and just have more of that one-on-one -on -one feel um, with them. And we've done one of those live chats so far. I've, I've really been, I want to do another one here in January um, again because it's just cool to jump on. It's honestly pretty easy to do as a content creator because I can jump on, answer the questions, say we're on for an hour, hour and a half, and then it's it's done. Um, there's no editing. There's no all the exactly, time. exactly. It's honestly really easy as as a content creator um, to make live chats and do live chats. And I think um, the viewers get a lot out of it too. It's something a little bit different. They feel more connected, um, and it's really cool to just see their questions. And honestly, a lot of it too. I told them I was like, I I want to know what you guys want to see for videos, or you know, what questions you guys have that I can help answer. Um, and it's, it's just been so cool to see how we've got such great feedback from everybody. The The membership page is growing every single day. We get new members that sign up. Um, so it, it's growing, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's something that I plan to do um, for the continuation of my channel. I don't, I don't really plan on stopping, but I'm definitely going to pull back on my public videos that I post on YouTube for muskies. Um, I would say 95% of my content going forward for muskie content is going to be on the membership page. Um, I'll do some public videos for musky stuff and then I've got to do some, you know, some lake trout and, and walleye stuff and maybe some bass stuff as well. Um, but a lot of my content, like I said, in my content as a whole, I would say 80% of it going forward is going to be on the membership page. Cool, man. Well, D Doug, I really, it's one thing I know, I know there's other listeners that were probably curious and maybe aren't a member yet and maybe we're considering, but now you know what's behind the scenes. And that is, that is really cool to kind of hear what's, what's going on in your head with uh next gen muskies and this takes me if it's okay with you and i you know I, i'm really curious to uh, you know dive in you know peel back another layer here on our muskie talk doug um and and you know i i am a super reflective person i i know you are it sounds like i mean this you you eat live and breathe and sleep muskies i mean this is you know, this is this is uh, what pays the bills, and it's also what uh, keeps us awake at night. And you know, and what what led what has led to so many great friendships of ours, and you name it. I, the list could go on. So here's my question to tee that one up. Um, you know, you know, here it is, 2023. We, we've got a season. You know, you don't have too many months until you're going to be guiding again. Um, and likewise for me, I was working here, like I said before we even started the podcast. I mean, I'm booking my my trips here for 2023 today in the office. What was what was the 2022 season like for you? I mean, I got to ask because, ah, Doug, I and I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth because I'm curious to hear. And the reason I'm asking this, I don't, I don't want folks to listen to this and say, Chaz, you know, look, look we've, we've done recaps before. I'm curious to talk to everybody about this because to me and to all of my, my local buddies who I, I would, I would, you know, kindly consider, you know, semi, you know, very honest semi-professionals who, you know, fish Muskie League and, and a lot of guide friends of mine in the Eagle River Three Lakes area. I mean, it was at least for us and I, and I follow you and your, your Canadian endeavors and all over the place. I thought it was a challenging season. I think it was an amazing season, but I think it offered, I don't know why, maybe in the last decade for me, it was challenging. I had to think harder this year than, I don't know, than, than years of the past. I mean, uh, you know, old, you know, secrets and tricks, they were not working in 2022. It was a, it was a very different ball game. Um, and I'm curious to know if you thought that, was that at all, you know, did it change throughout the year? Um, take us through maybe a little bit of a summary of your musky, well, I know obviously you've talked about you know smallmouth and walleyes, and you could probably do a whole you know you know ten days on that talk too. But musky specifically, 
Yeah. What was 22 like, you know, for you, you know, in 2022 was the, and I, I based this off of, um, the number of big ones that I caught is kind of how, how I went off of this. Um, but it was the toughest season I'd had since my first season, of guide, since my first year of guiding the worst season I'd had for numbers of 50 inches since 2018. Um, honestly, and you can blame a lot of things if you want, um, or make excuses. And I, I hate to do this and it's such a fishing guide thing to say, but we got so screwed with weather this year. Um, conditions in all the places that I fished. The, the only place that was really good for me this year was Minnesota. Minnesota was awesome. Um, but it was the time, it was the one place that I spent the least amount of time and I think I was only there for 15 days. Um, but it, it, Green Bay was super tough. We had a, we had a late spring to start and then in the middle of May we had a warm up to like 80 degrees. And all of our fish spawned and our river got way too warm. And when the water gets above 70, those fish bail. And come opener, all that was really left in the river was some males. Um, we caught a decent amount of fish, but we didn't catch any big ones. I shouldn't say that. We caught 151-incher. Um, but we had a lot of those high 30s and low 40-inch males that were just left from the spawn um, because our water just got too warm too fast. And then after that, I went to Minnesota, and like I said, Minnesota was awesome. We we crushed fish there. Um, I think we were there for 15 days. We had like 32 fish, and we had over a two-fish a day average. We had three fish over 50. That was awesome. I can't say anything bad about Minnesota. We had a, a great time there. And then I went to Lake of the Woods, and if anybody knows anything about Canada or is keeping up with that this year, the water levels were just incredibly high, the highest ever on record. Um and I don't, I don't, I never understood what six feet high meant until you, when Forrest was, and when I talked to Forrest and say, yeah, the, the, the lake's up six feet. Like you don't understand how much water six feet high is until you see it. Um, yeah, I've, and I've never seen that. I mean, changed so many things. Like, were, did you go to woods this year? No, no, we, you know, so no. Crazy. I, I, I spent more time on woods this year than I ever have in the past. Um, and it was such a challenge just due to the fact that a lot of those fish in Lake of the Woods in our summer peaks or summer patterns are generally from eight feet of water to zero. Like that's where they sit. Um, and basically you put six feet of water on top of that. And now a lot of their spots, um, just changed. And a lot of the spots were just too deep for these fish and they moved, um, in a lot of different locations. The, the things were just so different and I ended up fishing super deep and I ended up fishing a lot of. Uh, a much different pattern. The one pattern that I really got on that was good um, was fishing very deep and fishing, you know, summer peak stuff, but then targeting fish with bulldogs and tubes and lures that got down 12, 14, 15 feet um, a lot deeper. And it was such an interesting change of events, but it took so much time to kind of get right. And then the last three days I was on woods, the fish finally kind of started to push on structure and the water it came down about two feet in the time that I was there and things started to get more normal. And our last three days, we had like 20 some, like 22 bites our last three days of fishing um, and had some great fishing. Our last, this literally the second or our last spot on the whole entire trip, I caught a 50 and a half inch, which is just the, the second 50 inch we had the whole month, month and a half that I was there. Um, which for listeners, kind of, I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy for Lake of the Woods and, and the, you know, the amount, the knowledge that you, you have on that, you know, body of water. It's like, that's, that's not a lot of, you know, big, big, big fish, you know, comparatively speaking to other years you fished up there. You, you know? know, and I mean, I, I, it is so funny because I have Forrest up there who's my, kind of my rule of thumb. Um, he guides there year round and he he was doing really well those last three days as well fishing had just turned on the fish were showing up where they were supposed to be and in numbers and once i left and i had to go back to green bay because i had customers that had booked you know guide trips for green bay forest just lit them up and just (laughs) the whole month of august like the water kept going down the fish started to show up where they were and then it was just gangbusters for him and then i went back to green bay and then i came back to the when i launched my boat on august 1st um I launched and I jumped in the boat with a buddy of mine, Matt, and we went out and I think my water temperature was 59 degrees. Holy Um, cow. um, What had happened was when I was up in Canada, there was a huge west wind 
blow and what that does to green bay um, being a great lake and such a giant body of water and having even the late spring that we had um the main body of water the main lake of lake michigan was still very very cold and when that west wind blows really hard all you know all of our fishing is on the west shore of green bay so when you get that big west wind what it does is it blows all the warm surface water over to the other side of the bay which is 12 miles away um and then what happens is there's a there's current in the great lakes and in green bay there's there's a natural current and then with that wind the current sucked in a ton of cold water from lake michigan and the upper part of the bay and the up it sucked in a ton of cold water and then honestly just all the fish that were shallow and we're starting to set up for our like big weed bed bite that we get um it just pushed them out into the abyss again like it was you know just post spawn and i had just and all, all the guides that i talk with and communicate with on green bay like we all just struggled so much um i think i had what did i go like six days in a row without a fish i know another friend of mine had like 10 trips in a row without a fish um just crazy craziness and it seemed like wherever i went the weather just went the wrong way that i needed it to and this isn't me just complaining it was honestly no, dude it was tough. you don't have to tell me man because i had the same thing i think i you know i had a i had a seven day streak in june where i was you know and again it it, it sounds you know it, at the end of the day maybe it's not as dramatic as but i mean i guess what i'm seven 14 plus hours in a row and you haven't you haven't caught like the one fish you're after i mean it's i mean that's brutal dude yeah i mean I have lived it alongside you. So so just to kind of sum this up, so there's been, you would say 2022 offered a lot of environmental challenge. I mean, you got super high water on Lake of the Woods. You've got water temperature. You've got an you know early ice out, right? And you got super quick warm up. And then you come back in August and you've got like, you know, cool water and, you know, just because of this, this wind and you got some currents. So, I mean, like this definitely made it challenging to build consistency in catching if that makes is yeah, that sound about right yeah absolutely i mean the the two best bites i had were my minnesota stuff and then when i went back to canada in the fall um that lined up really well um we had some really good fish in the water temps kind of cooled down you should have just stayed in minnesota <laughs> oh i should yeah i should just <laughs> whatever <They're, laughs> hindsight's twenty twenty, but yeah it, there's a lot of things that you know just it was a right, wrong place, wrong time, and, and musky fishing is such a game of right place, right time. So, okay, so Doug, so here's the question probably everybody's. So now we've kind of done the debrief a little bit on 2022. I appreciate, I think that was a good, I think that was a good Cliff's Notes um, for a lot of days. Um, what would you say, now here's the, here's the tough question. What would you say you're bringing, so here was like, like you said, I think, I don't know if you said this exactly, but the most challenging season in a decade. What have you learned and what are, how are you going to apply that in this next season? Like, what have you taken away from all of your endeavors, whether it was Green Bay, Minnesota, Lake of the Woods? I mean, what's like, could you sum this up and say, okay, I'm going to, you know, this is, this is one thing that I'm changing strategy wise, or is there any one thing or is it, is it more complicated than that? I mean, uh, it's, it's definitely more complicated than that. Just, I think due to the, the, so many different um, places that I fish, um, but I would, there, I would say the biggest thing I'm going to walk away with this year is just having much more of an open mind to try different things and um, be open to change and be open to, like I say, fishing deep. When you go to Lake of the Woods in July, you expect to be throwing a bucktail on the top water in six feet of water and catching fish, right? Like that's just what you go there to do if you're going in July. Um, but like I said, my, my season ended up being – so much more fishing deep and i think that's something that i want to incorporate more into my plan for next year because we had some really awesome bites and fish and experiences with with fishing that stuff um and just changing kind of how changing off of the norm of you know how i normally go about my fishing in certain places based off the time of year um i'm definitely gonna change more of that but it was i learned so much this year um i learned a ton which which i do every year but this it, you don't learn anything when it's easy. You know, I've always said that you, when, when you catch, when you're catching fish, um, you're catching a lot of fish. You're not really learning that much. You, you learn way more when it's tough. Dude, that's, I don't think you could have said that any better, man. That's, that's probably the but, best thing you've said this whole podcast. That's it's, it's so, it's so true because you feel like when you're catching fish, like I'm doing everything right. I've got these things dialed. I know what's going on. Like I am the freaking man. Like you feel on top of the world, which is a great feeling. Do not get me wrong. Oh but yeah. When you struggle, for two or three days 
and then you make a make a change or you know do something a little bit different and then you catch a fish or two and then it gives you confidence in this new program that you went off of you just gave yourself confidence in a new style or a new part of your fishing that will stay with you for years and years to come. And I had so many of those kind of aha moments, uh, maybe per se, um, where I didn't catch as many big ones this year as I have in years past. Um, but I caught some big ones this year that I think, I don't, I want to say meant more to me, but taught me a lot more than other really big ones that I've caught in the past. Wow. Doug, it's, it's amazing. We fish different areas, but I, I, I could not agree with you more on the way your last, that that pretty much sums it up for me as well because i i would say the same didn't catch the biggest fish i've ever had in 2022 but the ones i caught and caught them doing completely different things because you had to think outside of the box you had to find a way to win they meant so much and it was really cool from a growth perspective from a you know from videography from client learning like you name it like so dude that's so cool to hear that um I guess I wasn't expecting, uh, I didn't know what to expect on your answer there, but that's, that's really cool, man. Um, okay, folks listening, I hope, you're, I hope you're still enjoying this as much as we are chatting away here. I have two more questions for Doug. Um, and So, Doug, uh, you're known as a big fish guide. I mean, I think that anybody that sees you, um, you know, and the, the, way, the reason I say that is, you know, of course, some guides are... I mean, everybody's trying to catch big fish, but of course, some guides probably tailor to, you know, numbers fisheries or, you know, I don't know, they're catching a lot of fish, but maybe they're not always holding, you know, muskies over 50 inches consistently throughout the year. I would definitely say, and I know, you know, your, 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 uh, your production speaks for itself. You're a big fish guide. What secrets would you be willing to share with anglers? Maybe folks getting into this sport, um, listeners on this podcast that have caught some muskies maybe they're looking for their first 50 this year um i think you're a person who you know, you've you've got experience on on different bodies of water and in you know to make maybe a, a general statement for our listeners here tonight or today um what would you share with folks as far as consistently targeting big fish i mean you know how could you sum that up for folks um what is your what are what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, I, I don't know how else to say it, but you know, how, how do you keep yourself on big fish? Are you are you constant? You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe you just take it from there. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a good question. And first off, you have to decide what it, what is a big fish um, for you, and it, it's all relative. Um, I'm very lucky where I run my business on a fishery that has a lot of really large muskies. Um, and it's all relative if I, you know, the, a 50 inch fish coming out of Green Bay and a 50 inch fish coming out of Vilas County are two totally different animals. And that's not me discrediting, um, a fish from Green Bay. That's just me understanding that there's a lot less of those living in Vilas County, um, than there are say in Green Bay or in lakes in Vilas versus places in Green yes. Bay. So the first, um, and like I said, that's not me discrediting anyone who's caught a big fish on Green Bay or anyone who's caught a big fish anywhere else. Um, it's just that you have to decide what, what is your big fish. And it's honestly, 50 inches is a benchmark for musky fishermen. And honestly, I, I think that's awesome. And I think it's great. But also, I think, I really think it's very skewed and very unfair to the fish because I've had customers in my boat who've caught a 49 and a quarter or a half or a three quarter inch fish. And they're just like, oh, it wasn't a 50 inch <laughs> I just want to slap them across the face, um, <laughs> honestly, because it's like you you can't discredit this fish for being, you know, this short of this specific number that someone put a benchmark on however many years ago. Um, but I think people just have to first off to just decide what is a big fish for them or what is their goal. Um, but for me, how I do it is. I'm lucky enough, like I say, to fish on some of the best fisheries in the world, to travel around, and and that's obviously the, the first thing is if you want to catch big muskies, say muskies over 50 inches, you have to fish where there is 50-inch muskies or where there is a fishable population of those fish. Um, I don't really spend a lot of time on bodies of water that don't have those fish, and it's not necessarily um, because I don't care for them or want to fish them. It's just I like the places that I like to fish and explore 
um, and go to. I, I do like catching big muskies, and I want to have the opportunity at catching a big one. So I'm going to go fish those specific fisheries, places like Green Bay or Lake of the Woods or Eagle Lake or Pipestone or Minnesota, right? Um, fishing those bodies of water that just have big ones is, is the first thing. And I, it's hard to say a, a specific tip to give people on how to stay on big ones or catch big ones. Honestly, the first is just putting your time into where they live. Um, you, if you want to catch 50 incher, you got to go where they live. It's as simple as that. But one specific tip, I guess, is hard for me to pinpoint. I would say really focus on um, learning your electronics is something that has helped me catch, I think, more more big ones than anything. Um, and then another thing I would say, too, is just being totally focused and you know you have to be perfect on every single cast to catch a big one um very rarely do you get lucky and catch a big one um you have to just be focused and be perfect and put all the odds into your favor sharpen your hooks watch your solar lunar tables watch the weather um you know pay attention to all the little details and all the little things that you can to stack the odds in your favor because big ones don't mess up very often i don't care if it's a 50 incher in green bay or northern wisconsin big ones don't mess up very often um, and you have to be on your A game and it's just so important to, I see so many people that come in my boat, um, that are fishing and, you know, going about the, the motions, but then they're not, you know, dialed in or focused on what's going on when the moment happens, because they're, you know, talking to their buddy about work or they're not focused on their figure eight or not looking behind their bait. Um, I get, my wife gives me crap all the time because I don't, she says I don't talk to her in the boat. Well, it's honestly because I'm just so <laughs> focused on what I'm doing. Um, that I don't want to mess anything up because you don't get very many opportunities. Doug, I really like that. So just to sum things up, so and I think that's an amazing answer to that question is one, and it's and it's it's a no brainer. But if if you're you know new to musky fishing, but you you know let's say you've got a you know some forty inch class fish, and again, which which are which are beautiful big fish. I love what you that you you mentioned that right because it 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 varies quite a bit. I mean, I always say muskies, you know, in, in Vilas and Oneida County. Muskies over forty-five inches for me are all very special fish. I, I, those to me are my, you know, I'm always shooting for fifty inches, but you know, my forty-six, forty-seven, and forty-eight inch muskies are those to me are are big for where I fish. You go to Green Bay, or you go to St. Clair, or you go to Lake of the Woods, or wherever it is you fish, Eagle Lake, you know, your 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 ball game changes quite a bit. But uh, regardless, a big fish is a big fish. But you have to fish on big fish water. But I love. What you said, I think, I think this, you know, is is a lesson to all of us, and I think it's even you and me. It's it's fundamentals, and and having quality fundamental skills, whether that's paying attention or or you know always being asked to. I'll just and I won't speak too long in this, but I asked uh, Booker a long time ago, um, and I thought I was pretty good. This is we've been, you know, I've been guiding for a number of years, and we've been filming together for a number of years, and I said, Joe, what do you think of my figure eight? And I thought I was pretty good. And he, he had some very, very kind feedback for me. And he had some, and, and still to this day, I think about that day on the water, that evening, I remember the exact spot I asked him that. And, you know, here is a, here I am. I thought I was pretty good, but we've all got stuff to learn. So I think that's really cool to just bring to light that, you know, it's, it comes down to skills. You know, you can be on the best body of water, but if you're not in tune with your electronics or you're not you know, it just, I, I think that's, I think that's very well said. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat generic, but in the same sense, I mean, when you, when you want to catch big fish, they're, they're so, there's a reason they grew big and there's a reason they haven't been caught by everybody. They're tough. They're tough to catch. You got to be on your, you got to be on your A game all the time. And it's very challenging to do, but, um, the beauty, the beauty of fishing. And I've always said this and I'm, I, I used to hunt a lot. I don't have any time to hunt anymore, but when I used to hunt, um, I used to love to bow hunt and I, I do miss it. I used to love to waterfall hunt. And the one thing I always said that was so unique about fishing is the beauty of fishing is that everything's public. All these lakes are public. It, there's no, I've got a thousand acre piece of property here or there where I grow big giant whitetails and they're on my piece of property and you can't come hunt them. The fish that I fish for in Green Bay, anybody can fish for um, you don't, you know, any, I don't care who you are. If you buy a Wisconsin fishing license, you have just as much of a right to fish the same wheat bed, um, as I do, or fish for the same muskies that, that I'm chasing. Or and that being said for any body of water, 
Um, and the beauty of it is that everything is public. If you want to go out there and do it, you can. There's nothing that's holding you back. And the other beauty of fishing over hunting is there's no such thing as tagging out because it's all catch and release, baby. That's, dude, absolutely, man. I love it. All right, Doug. Last question for you tonight. I'm absolutely uh, having, I was actually just thinking about, uh, you know, the title of the podcast, Musky Therapy. And I'm, I'm definitely, I, I have to actually admit, I mean, I feel, um, <laughs> I feel relaxed, but I, I think this podcast, I, this, this is getting me fired up, this conversation. So um, it, it's doing a, a couple of things for me, but here, here's, here's my last question for you, man. The Musky Therapy Podcast is brought to you by Joe Booker Outdoors number one in big game fish products, and by Recon Boats, made by craftsmen built for fishermen. Got her. Oh, my gosh. Um, and this is, this is a big question. Um, what's what's left for you, man? So here, here you are. How old are you now, Doug? 28. 28 years old. You, you've been guiding for you know, five some years, you get all, I mean, you, I mean, dude, I guess we, someone could look at your social media page and say, you know, you're, you're, they could look at your YouTube page and say, wow, you know, Doug's caught X amount of 54 inch muskies, 52s, 55s, you know, 57s, you name it. You know, you've, you've fished with, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the greats of the, you know, the industry and, and you've, you've, you know, you've got your guiding, uh, business, you know, you're, you're booked, man. And you, you get, you know, the, the YouTube channel is growing. It's like, you know, what's next for you? What's the next notch in the belt for Doug Wagner? Um, what's, what's your next accomplishment you're chasing? I mean, what does that look like for you? For me, um, I, I just, I love exploring and I just, I want to continue to go fish bodies of water that have, big giant muskies in them and i want to go and fish all of these places i have a bucket list of of lakes and rivers and flowages and all these other places in the world that i want to go fish and target these muskies and see how they act differently than other fisheries because green bay muskies and the great lake strain of muskies act so much differently than leech lake strain of muskies act so much differently than the wisconsin strain of muskies um all these fish act so different and i just want to go see all these amazing fisheries and and say that i've caught you know a fish here or a fish there or you know like i had a bucket list thing to go catch a muskie out of blacks and i accomplished that i think it was 2020 i caught some fish out of Malax in the fall um i always wanted to catch a big tiger on eagle lake i caught a big tiger on eagle lake this year um but even that like there's so many lakes that i still want to fish in the future that i haven't got to yet and I'll, i'm there's not enough life um lifetime ahead of me to get to all those places, but I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to, to get to as many as I possibly can and see as many of these lakes and places that these amazing creatures swim and target them wherever and however I can, um, across, you know, the U S and Canada. Uh, I'm just, that, that's my next thing is I just, I have a list of lakes that that I want to get to. Dude, that's awesome, man. Dude, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, Doug, I, I really, really appreciate um, you taking time out of your schedule. I mean, obviously, it's, I think I, I think I caught you. It sounds like at a good time where you're 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 in the studio, you're you're editing, you're ice fishing, you're spending some some uh, time with the wife and family. But uh, you know, I just I can't thank you enough for sitting down with me and uh, and chatting, man. This has been uh, an absolutely uh, wonderful time talking muskies with you, man. Yeah, no, it's it's good to catch up and talk, and I I appreciate you having me. That's it's absolutely awesome. I'm I'm excited to to share some more of the news about the membership thing and and kind of give people an insight. Um, I, I like doing these because it, it gets me just just as fired up as as you are right now um, for the next season. And people, I, I get such a short window where I'm not working seven days a week, but I I miss it from the first day I quit. I just I want to get back in the boat Dude. regardless of what Jason. I know, man. It's, this this is musky therapy. This this does help. It, it does help, and I and I want to do another podcast with you sometime soon, maybe before you kick things off in March. Your your last uh, you just mentioned there about musky behavior and how it varies throughout uh, musky country is a very interesting topic. So perhaps we will uh, we will get together and talk about that another time. But but dude, I uh, again just to sum things up, man. Um, I appreciate so much you coming on musky therapy. You're so humble. And you, you know, even after, you know, hoisting out, you know, just so many giants out of your net and so many great, great successes for your clients. Uh, you know, you just, it's, it's great to be able to sit down and just, uh, you know, talk shop like, uh, like we're, we're sitting at, uh, you know, just pub sharing a, sharing a beverage and, and, and chatting, man. It's awesome. So, 
Um, can't thank you enough, Doug. Doug, by the way, before we leave, what is the best way for folks to get a hold of you? You want to you wanna get a hold of Doug? I mean, obviously, probably all you got to do is Google Doug Wagner, but... Uh, I mean, any any other tidbits of folks are listening here and they're saying, hey, you know, maybe I want to get a hold of Doug, see if I can get on. Probably at this point might be hard to get on 2023 guide schedule, but maybe there's an opening. Uh, how would you how would you go about doing that? Uh, yeah, the best way, um, if you go to my website, DougWagnerFishing.com, has kind of got a basics or a layout of all my guiding stuff. And then outside of that, as far as social media, um, you can search Doug Wagner Fishing on just about any social media platform, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Um, we're on all that stuff with, with fishing content. So you can get a hold of me through any of those or, you know, directly off my website either way. Dude, awesome. All right. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed this musky therapy podcast as much as we did. Thanks again to Doug Wagner. And um, as always, everybody, thanks for listening. Stay tuned. We'll see you soon.